Dan, thank you so much for joining me. Um, previous guest, Jim Lair, was really kind enough to put us in touch, and I'm so glad to be able to have this opportunity to, to speak to you today. Thank you. Happy to be here. So I'm really curious because speed skating is not actually anything um, in the UK, and it's not a big sport here, that's for sure. So I'm really curious as to know, how does someone get into it and how did you get into to speed skating yeah so it's i mean it's not a real big sport here either other than olympic years but um obviously bigger than it is in the uk although short tracks uh gaining some traction in the uk they got they got a good really? team um yeah but uh i started i grew up in wisconsin and and you know back in the 70s uh it was the only there there was only one we our track is a 400 meter oval and uh there was only one that was uh artificial refrigerated 400 meter track in the country and it happened to be in my hometown and so uh you know it's why i started plus my family i'm the youngest of nine kids all my brothers and sisters skated at one point and then uh you know as they got older they sort of moved on to other things and uh i stuck with it my my next oldest brother did as well but um, yeah, so that's that's really it's what kept the fact that the track was right there made it not easy, but was a big reason I stuck with it because I was pretty good in in other sports. I was a pretty good athlete, baseball, football, American football, <laughs> and uh, and so um, you know once I saw potential in uh, in skating, I you know then I started to watch the Olympics. I, 1980, I watched the Olympics. I was 14 but that's when um uh, you you may not have heard of him but a man named eric hyden won uh five gold medals in speed skating every race from 500 meters to 10,000 meters and uh it's really it's one of the greatest olympic feats ever and w will never be repeated what he won every event in yeah. in in one one event <laughs> the, in, yeah wow that's no, uh, no relays, I, no nothing. All individual races from five hundred to ten thousand, and every race in between. But even that—that's uh, that requires like different energy systems. That requires like exactly. different training, and like that, that's like asking a that is literally asking a sprinter to then go and run ten thousand meters. It's, it's Correct. A completely different. Yeah. I have never yeah. heard of that, and that is an incredible story. Yeah, yeah. Then maybe you have him on a, as a guest next time. <laughs> <laughs> so so but, you, uh, he, he was sort of an inspiration for you. Uh, where was he from? Like what country? Very much. He was from Wisconsin as well, as right. were most skaters back then, but uh, not my hometown, but about, you know, 60 miles away. And, uh, and we certainly trained at the same track that I did. That was going to be that was going to be my next thing was did you train near him around yes. him and and then so did was that someone who essentially you could you could take little bits of information off find out what he was doing did you is is that what you did around someone like him yeah you know and then um so he he, he was just an unbelievable athlete so when he he did that he was only 21 years old in 1980 when he did that um by that point had won all the world championships then won all five races at the olympics and then he so then he retired uh and then he went on he rode in the tour de france uh, i mean just sorry what <laughs> uh just unbelievable guy now he's an orthopedic surgeon um oh my word. but but when eric yeah he uh he was obviously an inspiration and then i I was able to pick his brain a little bit as I went on to, to more Olympics. And, uh, he, he was helpful in that, in that sense. Um, although, you know, you, a guy like that, you think, you know, I was going through ups and downs. You, you feel like I, all he ever had were ups cause he won, won everything, but, mm. but it's not the case. You know, he, he certainly had, had every athlete has, has ups and downs. So did you have any, I mean, we'll get onto the story of, of sort of as you were in the Olympics, but were there sort of bumps along the road trying to get into Olympic squads and was it as plain sailing as it perhaps could have been? Well, so uh, making the teams was, went great. Like for, for instance, I was, uh, yeah, I was just 18 when I made my first team. I, I watched Eric do that. Uh, four years you know in 1980 and then four years later uh is when i made my first team and and honestly 
you know, at 14, it was just a pipe dream. And then you get, you start, then I started to grow, you know, as, uh, as boys do at that, at that age. And I, you know, I kind of went through puberty, got, got a bit stronger and started to learn, really learn how to skate, like no, get a feel for the ice. And, um, yeah. And then 18, I made my first team. So, um, but the, you know, the, the trials that year were much more nerve wracking than the Olympics themselves. Cause all you want to do is, is get there. You want to make the team. Um, once I did, I mean, the Olympics were just kind of icing on the cake at that time, uh, which happens a lot. I think for, in fact, every single Olympics I've ever been involved with either as a competitor or commentator, there's always, or I should say there are always, you know, skaters, and athletes, not just in our sport, but that kind of come a bit out of nowhere. They, they, they might be top 10 material, but never really a podium. And all of a sudden the Olympics come and they're so excited to be there. They, they exceed expectations and then the favorites have a lot of pressure and, and they don't necessarily uh, live up to the expectations. And so that you see a lot of uh, medal winners who've never been on the podium before. That I, I actually looking into a bit of, of the sort of world record holders of speed skating. I was really surprised mm-hmm. at how many of the world record holders didn't hold medals. Like there were mm-hmm. so many guys who had gone fast, but then when it came to the events, they hadn't, they hadn't actually won the event itself. It was quite interesting yeah. that, that, that that was something that wasn't just one person. It was a few people that had, that right. had done that. Yeah, um, no, it, it's, it happens. And, uh, you know, and it's why, Look, I mean, I had a lot of circumstances, which we'll get to, that that led to me not succeeding, if you will, at, at certain Olympics. But um, but sure, I mean, pressure and, and some of that was, was probably, you know, part of it. So you mentioned about trials, and I, I'm really interested in, in, in that because any young athlete that's listening to this will essentially, and that may have dreams and aspirations across any sort of sport – there will be a set, an element of trialing at some stage, and that is being put in front of a group of people and ultimately asked to show how good you are to get into a certain yeah. standard. And you, as someone who got through and managed to get through that, what was there anything you mentioned it being really nerve wracking uh, and that being a very nervous experience? But what do you feel helped you get through those trials and, and manage those nerves? So. You know, I, I believe, you know, to this day, I believe that a lot of my success at a young age um, came from being number nine in my family. So when I when I was growing up, I playing sports with my brothers and sisters, I always just thought I could do it as well as they could. And it didn't matter if, if it was a fact or not. I just I just thought, yeah, I can I can do that. And I would keep up with them and uh and it, and it kind of creates a mindset um, in that I was never really intimidated by anyone. Not to say I was a cocky kid going up there because, believe me, my, my brothers taught me that lesson too. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so, you know, you try to stay humble. But I, in my mind, I was never intimidated. Uh, I always felt that, I you know, I could do it as well as – as whomever might have been at the top at that point, um, you know, and then, so then, yeah, when the trials came, my first trials, again, I, it's not to say that I wasn't nervous because I was, but I, I do believe that that was a, that was a big help for me. And, um, and once I did that, once I made my first team from then on, you know, the next three Olympics after that, the trials weren't, weren't really an issue. We could train right through those. Yeah, I guess once you kind of it is true. Once you get into the system or you get into the bit, the, the high performance point of it, you can actually start to you set a standard, and that everyone's trying to chase that standard. Yes, right. that comes with different pressures, I'm sure. Um, but I guess once you're through that, it's it's a much easier experience. Um, yeah, for sure for you. Yeah. So you you had the dream of then getting to the Olympics. Um, did did you set out? the 88 Olympics initially was it uh, the Olympics previous what were you setting out in your so my first was actually uh, 1984 and 
and again, that was my only goal that year was to make the Olympic team. I just, yeah, you know, I, I, it was, it had been a dream of mine for a while and I just, I was to the point where I thought I had enough talent to, you know, I knew I was one of the top say, you know, whether it was top five for sure in the U S and turns out I won it at the Olympic trials at the 500 meters. But, um, but again, so then I went there with just eyes wide open and uh, just the excitement of the games themselves, you know, the whole experience. And, and I took it all in and, and I, I stickated great. I finished fourth place in the 500 and almost snuck away with a medal, even though it wasn't expected. So then leading into the, there's obviously the gap between the 84 and 88 Olympics. Mm-hmm. What, what were you doing in that period that what was the sort of, so the, I you know, the, even the, the training? The, the, yeah, the non-game. So we have world championships every year. We have World Cup circuit every year. So we have plenty of competitions. And after the my first games, that's when it, you know, it struck me. Number one, okay, I got, um, I finished fourth at the Olympics. I'm, uh, I think I'm pretty good at this. You know, I think um, I still, I knew I had a lot of improving to do, but I, I figured that. I was going to be around for a while and um, certainly was looking toward the next games to, to go in there and uh, have it, you know, have a legitimate chance now, now as a medal contender. Yeah. So let's, let's talk about the, the 88 Olympics. And uh, I mean, this is where really your story essentially really headlines right. um, all for just un- incredible circumstances in, in, in the sense, but Talk us through as much as you as you best can that 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 day that of the the five hundred. Um, yeah, I guess I don't know where to start well, for that. Yeah, I mean, I guess I'd have to go back um, really about a year before that because uh, it was it was January of eighty seven that uh, my sister was diagnosed. My sister Jane, the youngest of my five sisters, was just uh, just given birth to her third. Uh, baby girl and she was just um routine blood checkup after her is still in the hospital and they found low platelets and determined it was leukemia and um which is you know cancer of your blood and so so her year was was brutal really fighting fighting that chemotherapy all, all that goes along with that um meanwhile i was you know, now one of the favorites leading up to the 88 games in Calgary. And so, you know, we, I guess we all kind of got through that year um, leading up to the games. And then coincidentally, a week before the Olympics, the world championships just happened to be in Milwaukee, in my hometown. Uh, I went there, I won the world championship. Jane had, gone back into uh, out of remission um she was in remission for about five months and had recently come out of that so the cancer had come back so when i i basically said goodbye uh you know when i left but i completely i was going up to calgary for the games completely expected to see her in march when the season ended and that's how i left it and um literally a week later on the morning of my race uh, she passed away so the from reports of that day and and sort of your story that, that unfolded was that you obviously chose to stay and and do the race mm-hmm. what was the i can't imagine how em, the emotions that were going on in that morning um and also probably the 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 craziness of olympic games there was there was definitely you were the favorite going in, so there's going to be pressure on you to to perform. There's going to be yeah. also this incredible sadness and this trauma that's happening at home. What was the what were the dealing those motions like for you at that time? So, I, you know, as time has gone by, I, I sort of realize more and more um, what the emotions were and. What I mean by that is when you're going through it, it's it's happening. It happens fast, and you just you, you do what 
you know, a day is still only 24 hours long. And so that doesn't change and you, and you have to deal with all of this. Um, but really in my mind were, were, uh, you know, I've, I somewhat felt guilty for, for being there when, when Jane had passed away, uh, wondered if I should skate at all. We determined as a family that we knew what she would have wanted me to at least go out and try to skate. And so, um, so once that was decided, it was like, all right, let's, let's try to <laughs> prepare. But there was still no, there wasn't any mental preparation for the race, which um, you know, I, I guess I didn't realize how much mental prep you actually do, even when you're not consciously doing it. Um, so I still, I went through the motions of the physical side. I went for a jog, I stretched, I, you know, I stayed loose. Um, but my mind was completely elsewhere. And, uh, and then when I got on the, uh, about an hour and a half before the race itself, you get on on the ice for warm up, and I got on the ice and it was, it was scary how unstable I felt. I felt like they weren't even my skates, maybe not even my legs underneath me. And so then it was <laughs> deep down. I sort of knew that, oh boy, this, I don't know what's going to happen here. Cause you have to feel on, on skates. Think about it. We're going 35, nearly 40 miles an hour. Um, was that 25k or something mm. um um but the you know I, if there's no stability underneath you you can't let you just you can't let it go like you can't have any you can't hold back at all on the ice when you're a sprinter when you're going for it and if you don't feel with your skates it's it's a really hard thing to do you mentioned that you you I think whether it's a reflective thing, you didn't have any mental prep going into into that. Mm -hmm. Like you, and I've heard you say uh, whether this was post this games or or actually on this event, I'm not sure. But be, you essentially felt like you were physically the be at your best, but mentally you weren't you you're not there. Yeah. Um, so was that a fact that you your mental prep had gone, or you just didn't have one at the time, and that was a realization yeah. post that games? I, I just part of me sounds strange part of me didn't care or know if i should care about the race you know i, I literally felt half of my mind said what if i win you know do, uh, it, does it seem like i'm insensitive that i don't care about my sister the other half of me of course wanted, knew what i had been through uh, you know uh, as an athlete and 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 your chance right now to win the Olympic games, of course you want that too. But, uh, when half of your mind is fighting that it's, uh, it's not going to work out. But none of that, none of that is, uh, is unnatural, is it? That none of that is, uh, those thoughts that you're having there are, are totally normal. And uh, as you're saying them, I'm thinking they're going, yeah, I, I would be thinking pretty much the same. There's nothing, there that is is sinister or it's just purely you're i guess doubting that moment and there, there is li there, there's no other scenario i've ever heard on the on the in sporting history of of something like this where yes you might well, have some well, well there, there'll be athletes that have probably been told news but uh, is there other stories of, of things like this i don't know but but that's the point is that there was i'm, I'm 22 at the time there's no there's certainly no uh no precedents that I knew of or nobody to talk to or no, no book to read or what should I do? And, it, and quite honestly, even if there were, it's, it's really personal. It's, it's, it's yeah. in your own head. And um, yeah. And so it was, it was a really tough thing for, you know, really for a kid to go through, even though I'm obviously an adult at this time, but um, yeah. And, and, you know, and then I, I literally go down, you know, 10 seconds into the race. And then it was like, all right, well, what else can happen today? Number one, but two, I was like, okay, I got it. I just, that's over. I, I can't even describe how much I just at that point wanted to, wanted to go home, wanted to, mm. wanted to say goodbye to Jane. 
Now there were, there were three days in between the 500 and a thousand meters. So I still had to stay there for three days. Um, but I, I truly, I, after what happened that night, it was, it was just more of a, okay, we gotta, we gotta get this done and, and go home. I got I felt like the whole family sort of waiting for me, even for the funeral. And it was all of that kind of kept adding up to me too. I'm like, why? I don't want to be the focal point of this. Uh, this is about Jane. It's not about me. Would, was there anyone with you who was at the games with you at the time? It was luckily. So, uh, so that's been the really the saving factor in, in a lot of this. So having nine of us, you know, we didn't come from a lot of money, so not everybody could afford to travel to all the games. But about maybe three or four of my brother and sisters were with me. The other half were at home, and um, and so there were there. I did have some family up there that stayed right through both races, and they were there. Uh, in fact, my brother came into the village to spend that whole day with me, and um, you know, before the 500. And then on the three days between my, my races, I was able to spend it with, with my brother and sisters that, that were there. So that was a huge help. So when you managed to get away from the games um, after you've had, uh, you said you compete in the 5,000 as well. No, fi- no 1,000. 1,000, 1,000. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so you, you compete in the 1,000 and then you've, you've, you've flown home, I'm assuming, straight away. Mm-hmm. Um, what was the, after... I guess time had passed and, and you you had gone through the process of, of dealing with this as a family. Um, how, how long did that process take for you to then feel like you wanted to get back onto the ice? Were there moments of, I don't think this is for me? Was there, yeah, was there second guessing, doubts? What, what was going on in that period? So I went, um, I would say there was a, a huge delay in my grieving process and um or came in stages not like i didn't grieve at all but went home had the funeral we we did our thing as a family we said our goodbyes um i i still felt like all right now you know now what because now what do i just sit home i I had i have no idea nothing to do i don't know what i'm gonna do I went back to the games. Uh, I had teammates that were racing. I kind of, Bonnie Blair was a one that was a big story back then. I wanted to support her. Um, so I actually went back to the games themselves. And then from there, went back to Europe and finished out the World Cup season. I, I just I just needed to do what I was comfortable doing. I felt mm. like if I sat at home, I would go crazy. And so I think it was good for me good for my mind to to be able to do what i knew what i knew how to what i was comfortable with and actually did well i won the i won then the world cup um overall in the, in my 500 and 1000 i think and um so it was strange so then came home from that season trained all summer and uh the following season i uh, I was enrolled in the University of Calgary because we could train there and, um, and and then go to school at the same time. Well, Calgary is where this happened, right? Um, <laughs> so it was literally the fall the, the fall of the next season um, when I was up there at school that it all hit me because so mm-hmm. many things that I blocked out. I I would be walking from a class back to you know, and it would be like. I'd go through a spy place that I brought back a memory. And um, that was the hardest part. All of a sudden it was almost nine months later when I, it hit me hard and then I grieved and I was, I was a mess. I really was. I, I needed to, you know, to talk to doctors and it was, it was a tough time. I imagine with the, the amount of siblings that you have, everyone was dealing with it in, different ways i'm assuming mm-hmm. they have their, their, their separate families and uh, i don't know but are they are they in different parts of the world or, or the country or are they fairly close no by? you know luckily everybody was uh everybody pretty much uh stayed around and lived in our almost near where we all grew up so that was a that was a blessing 
yeah wow so you're going through that that grieving process let's talk about where someone like jim came in into into play um because i've heard jim tell your story brilliantly and and almost he he gets emotional talking about the story as well um just shows how much he does really care about his his people um so where did where did where did someone like him come into your life so uh, let's see um it was so 92 would have been the next games it was only a year or so before those olympics in alberville and (laughs) uh a couple reasons first of all as I said, for me, it was a, it was a, I was still kind of going through this whole process, but I would, I would be on the ice. Of course, I, you know, now I'm starting, I've, I've continued the seasons in between and I'm doing well, I'm winning world cup races and so forth. Um, but every single interview, and I'm not exaggerating. I think every single one asked me if I'm, when I get, to the 92 games when I get to Alberville, am I going to be thinking about my sister or, or about falling? And it's, you know, it's pretty hard not to when, when everybody <laughs> asks you that. Right. Um, and so that was, that was one of the things. And I was, uh, had an agent at the time who just so happened to read an article on Dr. Jim Lair in a magazine at that time, Jim worked with a lot of tennis players and mm. uh, being a former player himself. And and he said, do you think you'd be interested in speaking with him? And I said, yeah, I'd, I'd love to. I'd, I'd never never done that before, never worked with a sports psychologist before. And he really was – it was early in the sports psychology mm. world, if I mean, you will. He's one, he's, mean, one of the, he's one of the godfathers almost. Correct. And – and so I did. I went down to uh, Florida to meet with him, and um, and then we and we worked together for till the end of my career. Um, you know, as soon as I met him, I had this feeling of I don't know what it is about this guy. He seems to really understand my mind. He seems to understand what. Uh, you know, what makes me feel better when I think about it or when I think, um, you know, he seems to make me more appreciative of, uh, of what I've done so far. Um, and not, you know, and, you know, and that's a big part of it. I think, as you know, you know, mindfulness, uh, gratefulness, all of that is, is a big part. And, um, he really made me, instead of just thinking about results, uh, it was, it was really, process oriented and and being grateful for for all the things that for even the even the tough times but i could learn from those instead of just going through them and you know so um anyway so yeah we worked together but that's how it started and and it it was a it was a great very fortunate thing for me I, i think i heard him say that you initially 500 was your favorite event and you mm-hmm. didn't really like the thousand is that mm-hmm. is that accurate but he very accurate but he tried to help convince you to love the thousand yeah uh, so i i had a so i absolutely had the talent to skate a thousand meters i had the speed everybody knew that um it was more of a and and even the endurance i had the endurance because a thousand meters is tough you know, think about sprinting all out for a minute and 12 minute, 13, 14 seconds. I mean, it's, it's a controlled sprint, right? You have to, mm. you can't just run it like a hundred meter dash, you know, you have to be controlled. And, and I always, when I would go to the start line for 500 meters, I was, it was the greatest feeling I would, I would live for it. I would get this tunnel vision and just look down that straight and couldn't wait for the gun to go off. And I told him, I said, I, that's, that's, I love that. I said, I never feel that way when I go to the line for a thousand. I never do. I'm always worried about when I'm going to hit the wall, basically when, (laughs) when the pain's going to come and, uh, you know, and it's even the, even after some good results in the thousand, it just never, never cared for it as much. And so, yeah, we worked, we worked for three years on, um, I'm not changing my mindset toward that race. 
And you mentioned things like mindfulness and gratitude. Do you know the types of exercises that Jim and, and you had worked on in trying to change your mindset in, in that moment? Uh, you know, a lot of them were, were, some were basic without even having to do anything with my sport. Um, just, you know, writing down things every day that, that you're grateful for. It might be simply waking up. It might be uh, being able to see the, you know, scenery outside. It could have been anything, um, you know, and then you get more specific into, into the sport itself, but um, just general gratefulness is a big thing. I think that everybody can benefit from, right? I mean, because, it, you know, when we, when we go through life, it's you know, no matter what our little windows are, the things that we do, um, there's a bigger world out there, right? I mean, um, you and I happen to be kind of in the same business at the moment, um, but, but there are there are more things out there that other people have no idea, nor do we have an idea of what they do day to day, right? But um, but we can all kind of uh, have a common commonality about about just simply being grateful for things. Yeah, that's so true. Um, you then obviously after the after the ADA Olympics, sort of there was this run of what was sort of known as your jinx for a bit, and through through that period. That must have been very hard to deal with because, again, you are you are seen as one of the sort of favourites. You you've you've got the skill, you've got the talent. Um, how how did you manage that? Was there any moment as you crept again, probably closer towards that ninety four Olympics? Was there a moment before that ninety four Olympics where you thought, "I'm going to throw in the towel"? Like this is just uh, how how are you picking yourself back up after that? You know. I think with the success I was having everywhere else except the game. So um, going, you know, through Alberville in 92 was, and to this day is still just mind boggling that I, I didn't win the 500 or even win a medal. I finished fourth again. And that was, um, I kind of, again, looking back after all these years, I think I know what went wrong. I think it was our, our training program. We, like two weeks before the games, I, I set a world record and then, and we hadn't even rested yet. And I think we all kind of thought, all right, now we're going to taper and really, really lay low for a couple weeks here. And then we're really going to be flying. Well, we, we laid off too much. I think we didn't do anything that was intense or, uh, you know, and, and so it was just a flat feeling out there. I, I just, I didn't have, power i didn't have you know nothing to last it was strange feeling um you know having said that i still got fourth and of course it was heartbreaking but uh, now at this point we already had known they were going to start staggering the summer and the winter games so there's going to be another winter games in 1994 in two years and even in alberville after not going well um my coach and I discussed it and we, he said, you know, if you're in, I'm in. And I said, if you're in, I'm in. <laughs> and so uh, <laughs> we decided right there, we were going to have two amazing years and, and it was unbelievable. The, the focus we had for, for those two years, um, the results showed, I don't think I lost, I was beaten in a 500 at all those next two years. Um, and, you know, it was fun as well. It was really hard work, but it was it was fun. I mean, I would do it to this day if I if my body could still do it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so so you do get to you you're you're at the ninety four Olympics and that is what has been deemed your sort of last last attempt, really. Last last mm -hmm. go at getting getting Olympic medal. Um yeah. talk us through the the five hundred and then we'll obviously get on to the, the thousand. So what how did you feel going into the five hundred? I knew I was going to win. Um, I, I had, again, I hadn't been beaten. I won every 500 leading up on the world cup circuit. Um, I set a world record. I was the only person to skate it under 36 seconds, which I had done four times by that point. Nobody else had even done it once. Um, so I, I felt like 
you know, 90% of me is going to be good enough to win. Uh, of course, you don't go out and skate 90%. You still, and I, and I went hard. I, I was thinking, you know, go out and set another world record. Then they're, they're done before they even start. Right. So I got to the last turn and I just, um, I just, pushed a little too hard the first part of the turn and the ice broke away instead of kind of waiting for the apex of the turn to accelerate i tried to accelerate earlier and the ice broke away and i slipped um it wasn't a fall i didn't go down but i lost all my momentum and all my speed and uh all my acceleration out of the turn which is my strong point and so you know i knew right there that that it wasn't going to be a medal. And so, uh, yeah, I fought down the last hundred meters, but it was, yeah, it wasn't to be that. So what happens there? The ice breaks, breaks away. Cause these are, these are, this is an element of the sport as well, which is out of your control. Like that's. that's yeah. So, that's, I mean, and that's the thing people, people talk a lot about pressure and this and that, but sometimes, yeah, you're, you think about it. You're on a blade. That's about, you know, a, centimeter wide and you're going you know again 25 clicks an hour and uh or more no what it would be 40 miles an hour so it's more yeah. than that right yeah. 60 yeah um yeah. and so you know yeah there's a very 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 little room for for any anything that happened whether it's a mistake you make or whether it's just a slip and especially in the 500 meters um and so, you know, but it happened. And there I was now with three days again, just like, really just like the last couple of Olympics, three days to prepare for, for the thousand meters this time. You know, the difference was this time, a lot of things. This time I had Jim Lair. This time I had, I had the physical side behind me with my coach. Uh, we were so strong and, and I knew I was skating well. So people think, well, you know, now he's, now he's done his, his best race is gone. But in my mind, I'm thinking, I knew how I felt on the ice, which was great. It's not like I came in there and I was questioning anything, you know, anything. I felt good, solid, and I was strong and fast. Um, and so I thought there's no reason that I can't, I can't do, you know, go out and skate a good thousand meters. I had, um, I had won a couple world cups that season and thousand. Uh, it still wasn't my favorite race. No, the 500 was, and that was gone. Uh, I remember leaving the, the track the day of the 500 and, and Jim was with me and he said, he said, you have to forget about the 500. This, this is over. This race is done. It's, there's nothing you can do to change this result. Um, you've got three days to prepare for your last one. And uh, so from that moment, it was, it was hard because the next couple of days at the rink, all the skaters are coming up and patting me on the back and saying they were sorry, and, <laughs> um, which is great because it's nice to have their support and respect. But when you're trying to forget about it, it's not yeah. so easy, right? Um, yeah. yeah, so so it was tough. It was a challenge, but um, but I did a pretty good job of, of blocking that out. So are you going into that thousand meter race, and it's it is literally your last last race, essentially, and and you are um, you are now what? Fo are you focusing on? the gold, the world record, your <laughs> process in front of you, your technique, what, what is it that you're focusing on, on that start line? So, yeah, by that point, it was, it, you know, we kind of, we kind of did a little bit of a soul search in those, in those few days and with, uh, you know, with my coach and some with Jim, not together, it was kind of separately, but, you know, we thought, is there anything, even if there was one thing that you have done differently in a world cup in a world championship. Um, because I always go to the line with a lot of confidence and I expect if I skate my best, it's going to be enough, right. To win. And normally it had been. And I thought the only thing that I can come up with is 
that in those races, I never once thought, well, you know, in a few minutes here, if I, if I skate my best, I'm going to be, I'm going to be world champion. I never thought that I just went out and skated and then I was, and I actually did, you know, the, probably the night before I thought, all right, you know, I can, I'm going to be an, I'm going to be a gold medalist at the Olympics. I'm going to be an Olympic champion. It didn't change what I did or didn't do physically or even mentally after that, but it went through my mind. And so we said, all right, well, let's uh, get that thought out of your head. <laughs> Forget about results. This isn't about your result. <clears throat> let's change your goal. My goal now is not to win a gold medal. It's not to win this race. My goal is to skate this race to the best of my ability. The result's going to be there. The result will take care of itself if I do that. But how do you skate this race the way you know how to do it best? How do you do that? And what what's the process of that? It's a fast start. It's working the turns. It's relaxing the straights, saving that little bit that you can. Even though you're sprinting, you're still trying to have something left at the end. And so it was just a process of, of skating a great technical race as well as a tactical race. I really, I really love that story just because that – that lends so nicely to the the part that you've spoken about being really mindful about what you're doing. That is the most present form of a performance. Even mm. I, even of all the guests I've spoken to, that's the most present form of a performance I've heard anyone describe their performance. Just the fact that, all right, it's quite. It's, I think it's it's so simple to think about get that, or simple to say harder to do to say get the gold medal out of your mind because you need to or get the performance get the win out of your mind because you need to f have something to focus on you need to tell your brain what to do um right. and i even as you're talking about that i don't know if you've ever heard of will smith talk about a story that he has in his his book that about his dad makes him and his brother build a wall and he's like they they look at it and go we've got to try and build this wall like this is insane it's going to take us it's going to take us weeks and he's like don't think about building the wall just lay this one brick the best you possibly mm -hmm. can and i and, and i think of that in a sporting context that so many so many kids that i am seeing now they they get scared of even trying through this fear of failure because of the result is what they're pinging pinning all of that hope on and just yep. forgetting to lay that brick the best they possibly can at that moment. And that can be whatever it may be. It may be if you're a football player, like just putting on your boots correctly that at the start of the match and yep. just getting that going. And then the, what's the next step, the next step. And then ultimately your reflection is, holy hell, all of those pieces put together, put in a good performance. And, and that's the, it's kind of the really nice part about it, I guess. It must've mm -hmm. been when you crossed the line and you did feel that and you found out that you'd not only won but got the world record that feeling i'm only assuming but it must have been a nicer surprise because you weren't thinking about that result as like this is yeah. a given and and here's you know to i guess prove my point is that um there were still about 30 skaters that had to go i hadn't won yet but wow I set a world record. So I knew that I did everything that we said before the race. I knew that I, I did, I did my process the way I had to do it. I skated my best race, which was at my goal. I, honestly, I, you know, I, at that point you kind of know who the competitors are and who's capable of, of that time. And there weren't a lot, there might've been one or two. So I figured it was probably going to be enough for a medal and maybe gold. And I didn't care. I was so satisfied that i had uh achieved my goal of skating my best race at the olympic games and that um and so the obviously the gold medal was was a, a nice topping for that and um you know maybe i wouldn't be here talking to you today if it didn't hold up for gold right but um but it's a it's a great lesson and that you know my satisfaction came from the race i skated uh before i had even beaten everybody that, I, di I didn't know that part of the story that there were actually more races to go and yeah. and, and and skaters to go after in in that race that really is the exact personification of what we're saying there that's just right. perfect in every sense um so was there look I, there's obviously so much in that story and i'm sure you've had many times where you've you've looked back on it and reflected i, I i'm sort of really interested to know 
What did you learn most about yourself through your entire Olympic journey? Um, you know, I, I learned, I certainly learned that I was resilient. I don't, I, it's not that I didn't know that, but, um, but I learned that I could, I could go deep if I had to and, and just keep, keep getting up when, when, after I didn't win the 500 in Lillehammer was, uh, amazingly difficult to, to do what Jim said, to say, forget it, that race is over because that was like my baby. That was it. Right. And, and when that didn't happen, I had to find something even extra down there to, to go to the track the next day and to start preparing for the, for the thousand meters because you're literally heartbroken. I mean, heartbroken, mm. not, not in the way that I was after Jane passed away and I fell there that the fall there didn't even matter because, because of, Jane's situation but this one I didn't fall but I didn't win and I should have won um it truly was it was like my heart was broken and so how do you how do you let that go in a matter of hours and start looking forward it was um that's one of the things I guess I learned that that I was um I had more more down there than I may have realized and was there any moment that you are sort of I guess it's maybe really easy to to think of the thousand thousand meter win, the the final win in the gold medal and the world record. But are there any other moments that you're most proud of 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 your journey, other than that that gold medal and that that world record? Well, yeah, I mean, so there are results wise for sure. I mean, uh, I I was able to to achieve something, the 500 that nobody at that time, now everything's changed with the skates and, and so much of technology, but um, skating under 36 seconds was, was the first time I said it to the Dutch reporters, they kind of laughed because my world record was 36.4. And I started talking about 35 already. And, and a half second is, is a lot at, <laughs> at that speed. Right. And so um, when I did that for the first time, you know, for me, it was like taking the sport to a new level. And, and that's one that I will always be proud of that nobody other than skaters really know or care about. But it, for me, it's a, it's a personal one that's, that I'm very proud of. Um, you know, the other one is, and, and I'm not even sure this is a answer in terms of being proud of, but, um, the, the longevity that I was able to, to do, you know, to stay at the top is way, way tougher than it is to get there, as, as we all know. Mm -hmm. Getting there is one thing, but then when everybody's chasing you and everyone is trying to beat you, um, it's hard. It's hard to stay mm -hmm. there, and I was able to do that for, for 10 years or so, and so um, that's, you know – that says a lot too, because you have to, you can't, you can't just continue to train the way that you've trained to get you where you are now. Like you may have just won the world championship. If you just continue, if you do the exact same thing the next year, you might hang on the next year, two years from now, you do the same thing, forget it. You won't even be around. Like you have to adjust your, your, whether whether it's quantity or quality, most 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 likely it's quality of training um, with the times and and as with your body and with with getting older and all of that comes with that and so um, so longevity is a tough thing to to achieve. That's a really good point and and I I think I fell into that trap in my professional career. My professional career was cut short through injury, but um, I have seen other athletes. As they get older, obviously injuries and and um, mm -hmm. if anything, sometimes some more emotional damage and mental damage starts to take place. Some of the things that I've seen with them is that they it's it's really tough to get athletes to change their training because they've perhaps trained a certain way to get to the place where they've got to. Right. And I fell into that trap, which was 
I don't need to change my training because it got me to the place I am. It got me right. to the person I am. And I probably didn't have the initial foresight. I eventually did to then be, okay, no, I can adjust this. I can actually mm. tweak and change and develop and bring in. That was probably another thing, bring in new things. You brought in someone like Jim. You yep. you, you were adapted in, in that way. Um, it's such an important thing for athletes to have that awareness to – to be like not one size fits all all the time. It is. And the re I think the reason for that is because many, many athletes, top athletes, in a sense, because because of the work ethic it takes, are very close minded. You you have one focus and you go there. You have to be just the opposite to continue to get better. You have to be open minded. You, you can still have that laser focus, but you still your mind, you have to keep your mind open all the time to in order to improve and that goes for life you know not just sports yeah i was going to i was going to ask you what a characteristic that you have you felt was important to sort of achieve that best version of success or whatever that is deemed but i kind of feel you've answered it there with that yeah, right, with I being, would say being, <laughs> being being open i think that's such a a huge thing for people and do you know what with the divided world that we have now with many people sitting on well, I don't know where even if you're thinking just the left and the right it's right. it's it's very hard for people to be open minded but as an athlete if you're there are for every one of you that is trying to have a crack there's probably another 20 that are mm -hmm. either chasing you trying to get your dream and sure. ultimately, when I see an athlete or a young person trying to achieve something, I think like, how are you going to differentiate yourself? How can you be different from yeah. from the pack? Um, look, Jim, just I'm very cautious of time, and thank you so much for for giving it uh, today so generously. Talk talk a little bit about what you're up to now, uh, a little bit about the foundation as well, if 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 you will. Sure. Well, so professionally now, I'm actually doing similar things to that you are doing. I think I work um, with athletes, uh, work with, not in my sport though, um, because I'm not living anywhere near an oval. <laughs> I work with a couple of professional golfers and I also work, um, my main thing, I work with uh, drivers, race car drivers, NASCAR. Um, and it's interesting because that's, takes a lot of focus in that, in that sport. You know, people think they just sit there and turn the wheel, but uh, the speeds they're going and the, the amount of time they're going and the heat sometimes it gets in the cars just, just to stay focused is tough. So um, we do a lot of physical training, but a lot of mindset um, mm -hmm. and mental training as well. And then, um, yeah, my foundation is something that's been going since just a year after I retired. So uh, over 25 years now. And that's, we help families. When, when Jane was sick, she uh, had to have a bone marrow transplant out in Seattle, Washington, and uh, we're from Wisconsin. And so it's, it's a, it's a ways away. And so she had, she was out there in the hospital and housing we had for almost a year. And my mom and dad had to live out there and the rest of the kids were back and forth. And I realized some of the expense for the, just the non-medical expenses are, are mm. crazy and so what what a big part of my foundation amongst other things but uh is this family aid fund we have and we help families that are in this position where they're maybe their child is being treated i mean daily we get requests uh their you know the parent had to quit their job to be with the child now they're going to turn off their power or their electricity or they need gas money it, it the things that you think are little things, but they're everything to some of these families. And, uh, and so that's, uh, it's been, it's been nice. We've helped over a thousand families. We've given away over a million dollars now, um, for the foundation. And so it's, it's still going strong and, uh, we're doing well. Oh, in incredible. If people want to help and donate where, where's the best place to send them for that so you can uh dan jansen foundation and it's yeah djfoundation.org i believe is is the address but yeah if you just google dan jansen foundation you could find it i'll leave links in the show notes for sure so people can head head over there um look dan your story is is incredible it's it's deemed it's it's lauded as one of the most inspirational stories in in olympic history and it and it really does hold up to that but i think as much as 
the success of an as of an athlete that you've had i think the success you've probably had as a human being and and even jim attests to that as you being just a solid human being and 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 putting it down to that i think it's a real testament to just who you are as a person and, and have come out of that so being open to do a conversation like this just says a lot about character of, of someone so I, I am actually curious that with your story being so inspirational have you found a story in sport that you have found inspiring mm. for yourself? Ooh, great question. And I, I, I can't, of course, can't think of one off the top of my head, yeah. but I will tell you that I get inspired by like, I'm a crier. Like I'll, I'll watch the Olympics and see stories and cry. <laughs> and, and that's why I know, um, and not just the Olympics, of course, but, but it's also why I realized, you know, yeah, my story is a, it, it might be, you know, it might be one of the more unique stories, but, but the, every, everyone has a story and, and maybe on different levels, but, but it's all relative. Right. And, and we all go through ups, we all go through downs and it doesn't always happen in front of the world. Like it, like it did for me, but, um, but we all have those and, and we all have to get through them. So, you know, positive mindset and uh, those kinds of things are, are, essential really to um to getting through them and and also i i would probably add to that embracing that story i think there's so many people that mm. tell themselves a storyline of themselves that isn't really true or they mm. they don't want to own their story they want their story to almost be someone else's yeah. and Great that's point. not where that's not where the the real good stuff is your the idiosyncrasies yeah. in your life are the the beauty of what comes out and i think that's you've 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 caught onto something there where embracing your story and 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 living that story is is something that is will set you apart from from everyone yeah. else and and if we can do that a little bit more we'll be just better humans and better athletes that's for sure no doubt no doubt but jim thank you so much for your time i've i've absolutely loved this and i'm so thankful for jim uh, for setting this up so Thank you so much, and uh, I really, really appreciate it. Great. Thank you, Lewis. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. All the best.